On this episode of Resi Week, don't lose your star employee. Cybersecurity is arguably the most important part of your install. IKEA is making a run at smart lighting. All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is Resi Week, episode 61. Don't steal, Dave. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Peerless AV, the official outdoor display provider of Daytona International Speedway, and by Access Networks. This is Resi Week. Welcome to Resi Week. This is your weekly wrap-up of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott, for avnation.tv. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by the one and only Joe Whitaker of The Thoughtful Home and more recently, The Thoughtful Restaurant. How you doing, Joe? Thank you. Doing well. Doing well. Glad to be back on again. Thanks for being here. And I've got my good buddy, Tim Albright. He is the, the, the founder of this here property here. How you doing, bud? I am doing well. I have a new website. I'm happy. Yay, websites. Yay, yeah, if you website. haven't checked it out, it's brand new. It's fancy. It's super fast which is what we like. We're not messing around with junk. It's just quick and dirty. Get it done. Go check it out. All right. Let's kick this off with a good article that comes to us from CE Pro and Julie Jacobson on the cybersecurity business models, how smart home pros need to go there. Uh, This past week at the HTSA Spring Conference in San Diego, uh, Sonic Walls, Rob Krug, uh, was there. He's a, if you don't know him, he is one of those white hat, uh, ethical hackers who is all about finding the back doors and all the, the, the holes in your security, your, your network security system. And throughout the course, he, he kind of went through, uh, some of the easy ways that guys like himself, uh, and people who are not so ethical like himself uh, can get into your home automation system. Now, the the crux of this story that Julie pointed out was that, um, you know, through the session, they started to talk about how many dealers want to jump into this as a business model and look at adding and, and, and really being the expert on cybersecurity for the home and it seems that not a lot of the dealers were overly excited about that, overly enthused with that. And that's, that's honestly a really big deal. So, Joe, I know we've talked about this multiple times, but at what point do the dealers need to, dare I say, pull up their bootstraps and realize that if they're going to put stuff on the network, they're going to be the ones responsible for that network because, let's face it, most homeowners – they don't have some IT person, company, or supplier coming in and doing things on their network. At most, it's themselves or one of their kids or worse, you know, someone from their telco. <laughs> uh, yeah, and blame it on the ISP is not going to work this time. Uh, Probably not. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's however many years ago that was 15 when we all got thrust into being network guys um and now it's kind of turned around into being security guys as far as you know the net you know i think everyone has to take notice and i think a lot of a lot of people are late on on the bus this should have been looked at a little a little before uh because you know you had uh companies that do a residential networking products like you know luxel and package and uh y reboot access networks and for a couple of years, they've been telling us, you know, own the network, own the home. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do that, anytime you own something, you have to take responsibility for it. And that's kind of where the tricky part comes in. Because while it took five to 10 years to get our industry interested in and educated about networks, which we're still struggling with, by the way, mm-hmm. now we have to put another layer on top. And say, okay, besides you need, you know, learning about this, you need to learn what a DDoS attack is. You need to learn how phishing actually works. 
and how you can make a dumb device, an IoT device, default back into gateway mode, blast through that little gateway, and all of a sudden you're on the local network in the home and you can get whatever kind of traffic you want. So yeah. that, now, now we've got a whole reposition and a whole retraining and a mindset. And the thing about our industry, and you just kind of mentioned something uh, previously to this about, oh, Ubiquity has a, you know, this brand new dashboard and this, this, and the other. The guys in our industry like widgets. We don't, we don't like to have to you know, come up with a plan and come up with a way to do it. We want somebody to give us a box with the dashboard that's going to do it for us, and then we monetize it. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that's going to work in here, uh, you know, in our industry period. You know, uh, Access Networks is working on one right now. It might already be out. I need to actually ask him about that. Uh, you know, there, there, there's some people out there actually trying to tackle this. But the thing is, is cybersecurity and all the things, these attacks, they change, they change, they change. It's constantly evolving. People are finding new ways to do these things. And there's new devices coming out. One of the articles we're gonna talk about, there's gonna be a whole bunch of new IoT devices coming out. And guess what? <laughs> I bet you somebody has already figured out how to hack that before it's came out on the public platform, and they're just waiting for that to hit oh. a million houses so I can get a million credit card numbers. Well, and, and that's the thing, Tim. At what point do dealers need to either take one or two, one of two routes? I, 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 I see a a shift in the, 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 especially the resi industry between guys that are literally just going to do AV and all they're going to do is sell you that projector or that theater room or those, those in ceiling speakers. And that's it. They're going to wash their hands of anything network, anything smart home, anything like that, or, or at least they should. And then you're going to have the other full service network, integrators almost who it's more about the IT side of it and the security side of it than it is about the actual AV side of it. Because I don't want to say anybody can do AV, but it's not that hard to find some guy that can put a hole saw in the ceiling and drop a speaker in. Well, it's a whole other thing to find somebody who can put that controller on the network, make it accessible remotely Safely. Well, here's I, I go back to a conversation we had with Vin Bruno last year, last year's CDA, uh, CDA Expo 2016, and he was relaying a, an, another conversation he had and said that uh, the the residential AV person, the residential dealer, is probably more adept to network than the commercial AV dealer. Um, mm -hmm. And when you think about it, they are because they have to be. Um, I would actually question you and, and say that I, I don't think that. The person who's just selling product, uh, just selling a projector and, and just installing it is going to be around very long. I really don't think they are because of the margins are dropping and everybody that, that, that covers AV mm -hmm. has been talking about the margins shrinking for years where you have to provide a service, you have to provide smarts, you have to you know, do these things that make your product and your service and your company more appealing than the guy down the street who is just selling a box. So you, you need to be on the network. And if we accept the fact that you need to be on the network, then we need to have the next conversation with, which is you need to be concerned about security. Uh, I was a part of a PSNI uh, group a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we had a security expert. Her name was Teresa Payton. Uh, Teresa was the first CIO of the White House uh, back under Bush too. And she made the comment that you need to have the conversation with your clients. She was talking to commercial dealers here, but this goes for residential. You need to have the conversation with your clients about who's liable for what, right? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you liable for as the dealer? If you're setting up the network or even if you're doing anything on the network, if you're putting something on their network that is vulnerable, then you're going to be liable. And again, every law, you know, you check your local laws, check your state laws and, and your, your, um, your federal laws about who's you know, liable, but also check your contracts. You know, make sure that that you guys are covered, because here's the mm -hmm. thing: uh, if if you we talked was it last week or two weeks ago about a, a Wi-Fi lighting, um, well, it's Wi-Fi, so that means it's network, right? If you're putting things on the network that are suddenly becoming vulnerable, then there's a possibility that you, as the person installing it, and if you're doing a service maintaining it, 
you might be liable for any sort of breach. So if you are going to be liable, then it behooves you to protect your mm -hmm. business and protect your employees to make sure that you understand security or you have somebody on your team that understands security enough to where you guys can, can maintain and monitor what's going on on that network. So two, two follow-ups to kind of both what both of you said. One, at what point do you wash your hands? For, think... for, for, hold on, hold on. Yeah. But for multiple reasons. Either you have a client that isn't willing to pay for hardware that you can guarantee to at least some level of certainty uh, their safety and their security. And at what point is there that break even between, you know, doing essentially doing the best you can with the included or, or available equipment, because obviously using a, you know, telcos router is only going to afford us so much security, but at the same time, I can't put an ISR like a Cisco ISR in every client's home at 1500 bucks plus configuration or whatever that is American. <laughs> but where is that, where's that break even and how, how do dealers best approach that? So I'm going to give you my two cents and I want, I want to hear Joe on this. Uh, what I would say is where do you wash your hands when they tell you that, that they can't afford the systems to be secure? Um, and you got to document again, that stuff. Well, you have to document. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> this is when you, this is when saying no to a client and saying thank you for the opportunity, but we're going to walk away from this from this opportunity to protect your business because it's just not something to, to screw around with. I mean, there you know there are lawsuits. Um, the the one of the, one of the most famous data breaches is, is was Target, and that was an oh. you know that, that was an HVAC dealer that had a a device that that people got in the back door that way. But Home Depot with CCTV, CCTV. So th th these are systems that people are are, are able to hack. What I'm saying is that, that companies and, and, and smart homeowners are getting to the point where contracts are being written where you guys are going to be liable. So what I would say is you learn to say no if they aren't willing to secure themselves or have you secure them. Mm -hmm. Joe? I would say close, and I would agree with that statement. Um, however, you, you, know, you know this industry – Turning away money is kind of hard when it's, you know, they're, they're willing to spend a hundred grand on a theater or something. You, you know what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. turning, turning things down is hard, but protection is going to be important. Uh, I'm a huge fan of waivers and disclaimers and, and things like that. And one of the most common ones that I've ever used in the last five years is kind of an IOT disclaimer. Um, you know, you start adding devices onto your stuff, um, I'm not liable for that or anything that that may cause, whether it be Zigbee storms, whether it be IP conflicts, whether it be, yes, we'll come fix it, but you're, we're going to have to charge you for that. Um, the other one is, you know, there's a lot of uh, small business owners or even big business owners where, you know, we do things inside their house and they might have an IT guy or somebody. The guy comes in and does, doesn't do a VPN and does port forwarding, you know, so what do you do with that? You know, that you, you've got to, there's got to be a point where you kind of cut off uh, the liability and uh, put, put it on the client. If they don't want to spend to secure this stuff, that needs to be their responsibility. It can't can be ours, but you can't turn down every job uh, because people need to work and people need to eat. So, you know, you've, you've got, you've got to be able to have a cutoff. But you, well, but you were saying is you, but you at least protect yourself with the waiver, with the legal. Yes. It's the same that, thing with service mm -hmm. contracts, you know, when, and this is typical of anybody that does service contracts, you offer a service contract and they choose not to get it, you immediately let them know, okay, you know, van roll is going to be this, remote support is going to be this per hour. You're, you're telling them right off the back, okay, that, yeah. that responsibility is yours now. Okay. So all a service contract is is an insurance policy on technology. So you don't want the insurance, you know, here you go. Well, and a nice way to that we've always found to kind of sell that side of the, the secure things is just quickly run a quick calc on what it would cost them to bring in another net connection. And like we do this with, with corporate all the time. Okay, so you don't want to secure your whole network? All right, so let's grab you 
a second, you know, backup connection that will put all this junk on that no one really cares about that we can't have affect your business. And all of a sudden that hundred dollars a month for the foreseeable future, eh, maybe we will get the ISR. That's not that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Now, this is a, a really good article that came to us from Residential Systems from Henry Clifford. If you don't know Henry, he is a, he's a rock star guy. He's a really cool guy to get to know, so reach out to him. But uh, the long and short of this article is help. My rock star employee just put in his two weeks notice. Uh, through the story, Henry goes to explain how essentially a quote unquote Dave, who is arguably one of his best employees, decided he was going to hand in his two week notice. Now, what Henry outlines is what he went through and what uh, his business partner went through as they tried to determine what it would take to try and keep uh, Dave on board because they like Dave. Dave's a good employee. He works hard. Their customers like him. And he, you know, pretty, pretty much outlays the couple of things as far as, you know, determining why this employee is looking at moving on or looking at other opportunities and kind of going through the, the, the pros and cons of what it would take to hopefully keep him. Now, one thing I will say is a read the article, but B read the comments. <laughs> These comments were fantastic. Um, but let's jump right into this. <sighs> Tim, when looking at uh, employee management, essentially just in general, which is really what this is, yeah. obviously there comes a point when most uh, employees who are arguably good at what they do realize that they may be able to do a little better somewhere else. What's involved in trying to A, monitor that, but B, tell the difference between someone who is looking at other opportunities just because there's another opportunity or they're looking at opportunities because usually unbeknownst to you, they're disgruntled. Well, the, the article actually goes into that a little bit and it was, it was eye opening for me because he, the first thing they did was um, he and his ops manager was determined whether or not this was an employee they wanted to keep. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's honestly, the, that's the first question really. If somebody turns in their notice, the first question is, okay, do I want that to happen? Uh, and then they went through and, and, you know, in talking with some of the other employees, found out exactly what the, the new offer was. And they figured, you know what, here's the thing. Here's some things that we can massage and, and be flexible in our own mm -hmm. organization to help keep them. So they wanted to keep Dave. And so they were able to, to make the adjustments. And I think that flexibility is really the thing that I, I took away from that. Um, I was reading something the other day. Uh, there's a company that's using IBM for their flex spaces and for their flex employees. And these are folks that, are, that have disparate employees all over the country. And they're able to give their employees the flexibility because this is something that has come up through their culture that that's important to them, right? Now, for, for you and for Joe, you know, having somebody have flex time or, or the ability to work from everywhere isn't going to work for every employee, right? You can't have your installers mm -hmm. living in Manitoba or, or uh, Nova Scotia and still do installs in London, right? Um, that would be challenging. That would be challenging. It's a big country. <laughs> but, for, but for other employees, it might be, right? For, for your you know, account managers or for accounting or for ops or what have you, uh, and I'm just throwing possibilities out here, that's, mm -hmm. that's a possibility. So the ability, it, being flexible, I guess, is the best thing I, I took away from that. Joe, obviously it's, it's always tough to evaluate your employees uh, best because there, there's just so many factors that go into it. But when you're trying to, you know, look at keeping someone uh, and it, it, it's someone that you like, what do you need to do to kind of balance the, we keep them because they're profitable for us. They make us money versus we want to keep them because we, we personally like them. I, I've been in that situation before. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, is this article, and, and, you, and you pointed out the comments. Uh, there's some hilarity in there, and there's some, there is. Know, some different ways to look at things going on in that, in that whole thread of comments. But, uh, yeah, 
you know, Henry, call me. I'll come mow your lawn for free on, on Saturday. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of things to think about in it because and it happens to the best of us. Business owners become complacent in the day-to-day. -day. And even if we do, you know, do an evaluation, we'll, we'll probably, we might not be doing the most comprehensive evaluation on an employee to see whether they deserve more, whether they need more, or, or, or these things. That's really where it goes back to it. And this whole thing is the management of the business itself and how you handle employees. Um, you know, when you're, when you're swamped, finding time to sit down and actually do a real evaluation is, is a rough thing. And then how do you quantify how much money that individual employee is actually making for you? You know, mm -hmm. are they growing? Are you able to um, sell higher services or higher installations based on that particular employee? So when you're taking it to the employee level, it just takes a minute to figure out, hey, you know, this guy is worth a couple more bucks or, you know, a couple more benefits. Mm -hmm. I've had guys leave before. I've stolen guys from other companies before. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. You know, you see a rock star and you're not taking care of business. Well, you know, I will swoop up and get him. But I've had Don't that. Don't steal Dave. Well. Leave Dave alone. Leave Dave alone. Uh, <laughs> let let he Henry hire Dave back. Come on. But, but you know, th this, this article opens up some other things. Yes, you should keep your good employee but you shouldn't pay someone more than what they're worth. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you take the average, you know, uh, what, what you expect to actually pay for, for an hour of charge labor that you charge, you know, whether you're doing, you know, you're, you're adding overhead into that or benefits or vehicles or insurance or anything else that you're putting in your, your hourly wage. And you say, okay, this guy needs to be responsible for that much. All of this is getting paid for. There's this much gap because he's bringing that much more value. I should probably pass that on to him or increase benefits or something like that. You know, those mm -hmm. are things we have to look at. But this article brings into something that some people kind of touched on, and that's the legalities of what we do. You know, this is yep. talking about, you know, travel time and this, that, and the other. Something that our company went through an exercise on last year. To since we operate in more than one state, more than one territory, okay, what's legal and what's not? You know, how are we supposed to pay these guys? This, that's the, the true gold inside this story. Not how yeah. necessarily how to keep an employee. If they're worth it, you pay them and they'll stay. Period. When somebody starts looking for another job, there's a reason why. Whether it be pay or if they just had a kid, they need some extra benefits, or you know, there's there's a ton of things, or they just don't like you. You suck as a boss. You know, I'm not saying that about Henry. I <laughs> Henry is awesome. But these are all things that happen when you have employees and they're things mm -hmm. you have to deal with. But before you start dealing with those, you need to look at those legalities. You know, is he well, traveling in his own vehicle? Okay, you got to pay him. Is he a passenger in somebody else's vehicle? You don't have to pay him. Are you flying him? You don't have to pay him. Unless he uses his computer during that flight to do work. Then you do have to pay him. See, it gets really tricky. You know, and you see all these comments, and there's a lot of things to think about. And travel time, legally, you can have two separate wages. You can have a working wage and a traveling wage. Mm -hmm. Perfectly legal. So these are all things, yes, wait, you know, wage step kind of can't play into that. But it, when it comes to keeping an employee, do what Henry did, evaluate the situation. Is he worth it? Is he good for the company? Which obviously Dave sounds like Dave's amazing. Um, Don't steal Dave. I, I, I Hands off Dave. I thought about it. Oh, uh, Dave might want to relocate, you know. I'm he just, might. He uh, is a beautiful city. Well, and, and, and <laughs> Joe, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing out of this article is, you know, obviously trying to keep somebody or, or whether you lose them or whatever is, is kind of a misnomer. It comes back to, and this is something we talk about on the show all the time. It always comes back to you need to run your AV business like a business. Exactly. You're not just a speaker or tweeter anymore. You've got to deal with it. All right, let's jump in to the last story of the day and arguably one that I was, you might be shocked at, but most excited about. This comes to us from The Verge. IKEA is posed to do for the smart home what it did for design. Now, to summarize this really quick, they're getting into lighting control and potentially more smart home stuff. A um, couple quick points that I want to hit uh, just to cover. You can obviously get these from the article. Last year, IKEA had over a billion store visits worldwide. 
that was B with a, or billion with a B or B with a billion. Um, they sold 7.6 million LED bulbs and arguably all cheaper than anywhere else. So what this brings to the table is this new system that they're uh, looking to release in the U.S. this year is cheaper than Hue, its closest competitor. Now, we talked about Wi-Fi lighting last week or the week before, and honestly, we kind of poo-pooed it. Now, why I'm excited about this is we always complain about you know driving down to the lowest denominator and going to the lowest buyer, but we've been trying to figure out how to get more younger people excited about smart home technology and giving them something that works. And I'm going to argue that if anyone can do it effectively and market it and get it in front of a billion people, it's going to be Ikea. Joe, am I right or wrong? You know, they also right. sold horse meat. Do you remember that? Yeah, but that was a long time ago, and that wasn't in the U.S. <laughs> so, you know, you got, you got horse meat and you got furniture that, you know. Uh, Sarah, my other half, is not allowed to go in Ikea, ever. <laughs> ever. But, I'm like, it's a particle board. Um, so, but no, but this is interesting. Oh, hold on, though. They don't make any bones that it's not particle board. <laughs> uh, agreed. Okay. At okay. least they're honest but, about it. But, but here's, where, here's where I'm going with that. So the, the, this article, which, by the way, guys, I'm actually very interested in this and how this is going to play out because if they are smart and before this hits the U.S. market, there will be a control four driver, a Crestron module. A, if they are smart, uh, guys, Ikea, if you happen, your media people happen to see this, do that before you hit this market and you are going to be printing your own money. It is going to be ridiculous Will because be that's how, that, that, that transcendent spot where you're, you're Phillips Hue and then you make your stuff in, you know, integrate with other stuff a year later. Thank Don't you fly. for screwing that up, Phillips. Um, but the interesting thing about this is the way the Verge proposed this. I don't like it, but it's good at the same time. All they're going to do is lighting, but it's not smart home. It's just freaking lighting. It is. It's like having a clicker for your garage door opener and calling that smart home. Right, right, right. You're taking one segment that so far, according to the press and everybody else in the media, doesn't tie to anything else. It's not necessarily smart home. Well, and, and the article might be in name misleading in that sense. But what I'm more excited about is I, I hate when I- A billion people, a billion. Yes. yes. That yes. is why I am so excited. You're I absolutely to figure out a billion people with mm -hmm. not just LED lighting, getting away from halogen, incandescent, CFL, everything else. You're going to educate them on connected devices. Exactly. A billion of them. Just a billion people. And, and, and think about the demographics when you walk into an IKEA, which you don't do, Joe, Millennial. because otherwise your wife would be there with you, but everyone else does. And when you walk in there, the majority of people are under the age of 40. Absolutely. Yep. And those are the ones because those are the same people that, you know, they're walking into Home Depot and they saw the wink on an end cap for three weeks and then it disappeared because wink went bankrupt. Then they saw they something really else. Wink. Exactly. Then they saw something else. Then they saw another thing and it disappeared. Ikea is somebody who has the capability to bring this and make this function. Timmy, are you excited about it as we are? I, I am. And we're pretty pumped. For, for the same reasons, right? Um, anything that you can get to drive recognition for the populace in general on what we do. And again, I used to be a programmer. I still couldn't control is still my, my, uh, the thing that gets me excited about AV. So getting folks, a billion people um, exposed to this and getting it you know, in the nomenclature um, and getting people used to the idea of controlling their lights and eventually who knows where, where Ikea will take it, but uh, they have the breadth at least of products and verticals. I mean, you walk through an Ikea and you can basically walk through somebody's house. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, they could in theory 
expand this to other devices and other parts of the home, whether that's the kitchen or that's somebody's bedroom or the bathroom. I'm, I'm going through my head all, all the different areas of, of Ikea. But, you know, you walk into, you know, 15 different kitchens at Ikea and you could, in theory, imagine that these connected devices or these controllable devices uh, would be front and center um, for them to be able to sell. Well, and when you look at everything else that they make and offer, um, whether it be appliances, whether it be anything else, it just opens the opportunity for that one-stop shop of, hey, here's some cool stuff that you can actually do in your house. So I'm pretty excited. And, you know, I've looked at, you know, the the product offerings, which is also, yes, it requires a hub. What Mm -hmm. does it? Um, And, I mean, it's actually pretty good stuff. I mean, it looks good. Yeah, It looks good. I mean, it's terrible with everything everybody's kind of used to now as far as that. It looks well, that's good. the thing. Like even with and their it's LEDs, cheaper. eleven it's bucks. Eleven, 11 bucks. bucks for a controllable LED bulb. Yep. It's fantastic. I wonder if they're going to get sued because I don't remember who patented the circle. Wasn't that Levitin or somebody? Yeah. Yeah, somebody like that. You know, they sued Nest because that little remote reminds me a lot of that old Savant remote. It's going to be though based out of Sweden, and then you're into international tort law, and it'll be uh, fine. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I, I think I, I actually think it's going to be good stuff. And, you know, for us, you know, what we might not think about, but I personally do, is a lot of small businesses, uh, especially doctor's offices, dentist offices, all mm-hmm. those kind of people, they get a lot of their stuff at Ikea nowadays. Yep. So where we're opening the door for those devices to start coming into these small businesses, and that expands what we can actually do. Well, and the other side is, once you start to look at a product like this being readily available at a very affordable cost, those people will, you know, the, the, the same guys that buy that and then don't ever want to move beyond that, they were never going to be your cu- customers anyways. Absolutely. But the ones that get in the door and go, oh, this is really, really cool. I want to do this. I or should I want, find somebody I wonder if that I does can that. control this. Exactly. You know. That's where our next group of potential customers is going to come from. Yep. It's going to come from those, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in embracing the DIY mindset because you, it's very hard to make money there, but to embrace the people that want to move beyond DIY, whether it be do it with me or do it for me or whatever, that's, I, 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 Personally, I believe that is where our biggest opportunity lies, that network security, since we talked about it. Yeah. That and do it for me are, mm-hmm. are the, the, the big keys to the next five to 10 years. Yeah, very much so. All doubt. right, gentlemen, I got to cut it there. Otherwise, none of us will get any work done today. Thank you so much for being here. Joe, where can people connect with you? Uh, people can find me on Facebook at The Thoughtful Home and on Twitter at Thoughtful Home or, I don't know, just email me, Joe Whitaker at, or Joe at TheThoughtfulHome.com. And don't forget about Cedia. Find me at Cedia yes. as well. Hey, me too. I'm excited. Tim, where can people find you? I'm at Cedia with you uh, in San Diego. Yay! Yay. In oh, San gosh. Diego. Uh, hey, you, you know Henry Clifford is on Cedia's board of directors now. He is. That's right. I had to give him some props here. The new yeah. guy. The new guy. All right, Tim, hmm? we're outside of Cedia <laughs> for the random ones that won't be there. Where can they connect with you? Uh, Twitter, uh, at TD, Tim David Albright on Twitter, uh, and also our website, avnation.tv, which is brand spanking new. So check that out. Brand spanking new. All right, well, again, thank you guys so much for joining us. For myself, if you'd like to connect with me, you can find me at Matt D. Scott on Twitter and every other social platform. But more importantly, please stop by avnation.tv. You'll find this show as well as a wide variety of other shows that cover all the verticals we cover. When you visit the site, the brand spanking new site, please take a moment to check out our underwriters. Uh, They support us. We're extremely thankful for it. And we ask that you do the same. Thanks for watching this episode of Resi Week.